Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is part three on our study of the subject uh, Eternal Sonship. And if you haven't seen the other two episodes, uh, they're available on my YouTube channel. Uh, probably be very helpful if you watched them uh, in sequence. But I think even if you just join us right now, it'll be beneficial for you. So welcome. Uh, I want the panelists to take just a minute to uh, uh, introduce themselves. Uh, just tell them a little bit about your YouTube channel, what you're doing, and uh, and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, let's start with Brother Bill. Hello, hello, the panel, and hello, YouTube land. I am the Panda Man Evangelist. That's my channel's name, and you know, by its own nature. You know, I, I evangelize, you know, and, and what I do on, on YouTube, on Facebook, and, and wherever I possibly can is to evangelize the, the, the glorious gospel of Christ. And, you know, obviously it's a pleasure to be on Brother Luke's uh, Hangouts because, you know, above all the other Hangouts, Luke has got some stability and, and we can cordially debate things well in, in a good manner and, and in a godly manner. So... That's my little plug for, for me and for you, Brother Luke. God bless. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that is a, an important uh, aspect of what we're doing, is that um, we, we can do, as it says in 1 Peter, uh, be ready with an answer for what we believe, but, but we should also be respectful and courteous when we're having these discussions on these theological subjects. So. Um, if you're on the panel, then in my judgment, you've passed that test. You, you do hold to the core doctrines of Christianity and all the other theological subjects. We have a good time discussing them, and uh, we don't always agree, but uh, we, we still love each other and respect each other. Okay, uh, brother, uh, brother Joe? Yeah, uh, my uh, name's Joe, and I'm, I'm on the Sebastian Dresden channel. At some point, I may change the channel name, or maybe I'll just change my name. I, I don't know, but I go by Joe or Sebastian, either one. Anyway, uh, I'm excited to uh, be included in this because I see so often uh, divisions in the body over uh, the person of Christ and the Jesus-only movement, and Muslims don't understand a triune God, and and even the, our Jewish brothers don't understand the triune God. And so this is an exciting topic for me. And uh, come to think of it, I really like what Bill said. I didn't know why. I said, why in the world do I like doing Luke's Hangouts? I, I don't do any other Hangouts, pretty much. It's the stability. It's a, it's a really good forum for discussion and debate. And uh, I'm just excited to be here. So looking forward to this week. All right. Thank you, Brother Joe. And uh, next, uh, we got uh, Brother Sam. Hello, guys. How are you? Uh, this is Thick Shays, uh, also known as Uncle Sam. The uh, the things that I do on YouTube is that the uh, I have few channels that have different topics uh, from news to social. Uh, events and um, personal things, but my main interest, and of course all the time, is anything to do with Christ, uh, especially when uh, we come across with uh, certain, you know, heretical doctrines, you know, I would like to, um, you know, talk about that and discuss about it. Um, Ever since I've known Brother Luke, you know, as like in always, I always challenge. <laughs> um, but um, over the years, I've got to know him, uh, and um, you know, I'm not going to be all the uh, you know praising of him in the public. <laughs> what you we know what he says in the scripture, but. Is a very upright, righteous bro. Uh, you know, whenever I think about the uh, uh, brother Luke, I sometimes think of the trouble that I kind of caused uh, because of uh, certain 
non-essential uh, salvation matter, a uh, certain doctrinal difference, I guess. Uh, I had a huge feat, and I kind of toned down, and I think because of Brother Luke, I kind of toned down a little. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I'm really uh, glad to be part of this uh, discussion group, and uh, hope to have a, a fruitful uh, discussion today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Brother Sam. I'm well happy that all three of you can join me today. Uh, b before we move on, I'm going to give each person just a chance to take just like one minute or so to give a synopsis of what you think we the point we've made up up to now. We we've already talked for four hours. If you were going to kind of sum up what we um, the points we've made so far. Uh, please take just a minute to do that, and then we'll move into the subject for today. Okay, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah. brief synopsis so far, if that is possible, is that I think so far already that we, we've, we've proven beyond all doubt that, that Christ was eternal. That's definitely for sure. I think, you know, we, we've gave massive uh, proofs, indications, you know, and scripturally sound proofs at that. That, that, that God is triune, and I think you know we, we're really honing the point. So just in the two hangouts we've had already, that the point that that is so important and so vital at the bare minimum that that that, that as Christians and true Christians, that that we at least believe that 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 Christ is eternal, and I think that is that is coming home, you know, loud and clear. You know, I don't think we, any of us on this panel can dispute that. The Bible certainly doesn't. But that is that is what you know I've gleaned out of this, and what we've you know all different scriptures we've been passing to and fro, as proven that beyond doubt that, that that Jesus Christ is you know God eternal. And I think you know we've done a, you know well through Christ obviously and the Holy Ghost using us through these hangouts as making that point very clear. And I think we're, we're, we're doing well in that. But there's still more to come, which is, which is excellent. All right. Thank you, Brother Bill. Uh, and and brother, brother Joe, uh, how, how do you how would you sum up what we've said so far? Well, I think we've used a lot of scripture to uh, designate some basics. For instance, Jesus Christ is God. Uh, I think we've used a lot of scripture to uh, prove uh, by scripture that God is one in essence and in will and in substance and that's important and I think we have done a good job of also showing that God is three in persons and that's personalities individuals who hold different roles within God and while he is one in substance and essence and will I think we've done a good job so far in showing he's three persons in position and in in, uh, in job responsibility, if you will, or uh, in the family of the Godhead. Every every one of them has their own uh, uh, job. I don't like to say job; it sounds so uh, pedestrian. But uh, they all have their their own uh, sources of uh, function within. The Godhead. All right, all true. We've we've pretty much uh, proven all those points, and uh, as we move forward, uh, we're going to be talking more and more about uh, the pre-incarnation of Jesus. So, you know, we we know that He is eternal. We know He is God Almighty. We know it that Godhead is triune. Uh, but we're going to really look at uh, this pre-incarnation existence, how did this Godhead exist pre-incarnation is what we'll be moving into as we go along. Uh, Brother Sam, uh, what's your um, summary of what we've said so far? Well, I haven't been in previous discussions uh, due to family matters and, and things. Uh, me, myself, and Sam. Um, they're all me. <laughs> Has a name. I'm sure I have functions and stuff. Um, sometimes um, daddy and so on and so forth. 
Um, I, I think a lot of um, if you're talking about the Tribune God, the nature of God, and Muslims especially, they do not understand that very Godhead. Um, apparently, maybe they are too much into their um, physicality. Um, maybe they kind of feel that uh, the spiritual matter is kind of quite distanced. Or whatever it is, you know, we are not just our body only. You know, we are also our soul. We are also our spirit. We are composed of many different parts, and that makes, you know, for example, like me, myself, I uh, have a different, you know, functions, of course, but mainly I even have soul in me, and that soul itself is me, the essence of me. So, in that regards, I think that, um, you know, if they approach that, they, maybe they can understand the, uh, the you know, tri tri uh concept of God. But the one thing that's kind of non-related to that matter, but yet a little related uh, conversation that I had earlier before this hangout, uh, one of the brethren asked me a question, and then which led to uh, Jesus atoning for people's sin. And as we know that Christ died for all mankind, and that's one of the reasons why universalists, they say that uh, therefore all will be saved eventually because Christ died for uh, people's sins, uh, Jesus atoning for people's sin. And I looked up uh, what atoning means, and uh, it, it says to make amends uh, and um, you know I was talking to the bro a brother and saying you know making amends is a mutual thing so in other words Christ made that Christ made the amends with all men meaning Christ died for all men's sin now it's man's choice to believe and accept Christ or not. So, you know, I think when we uh, uh, we talk about this sort of um, triune uh, God, uh, because some people don't understand what, what and Christ stands for and what Christ said and done for us, Maybe there are many misunderstanding. It seems like, and even Christ said, "Knowing Christ is like knowing God." So you know, if you don't know Christ, you don't really know God, and you probably make a lot of mistake uh, and make a lot of conjectures and bad understanding, misunderstanding uh, against God or about God. All right, Sam. Thank you. Uh, I, I know your, your point was uh, off topic, but I'm glad you made it. I think it's a very important point. I I've, haven't ever heard it expressed that way, so I'm glad you uh, told us that uh, about this um, this atonement and this being a two way two way thing. Is we we realize that that it's conditional. If it was unconditional, like a Calvinist unconditional election, that means that. God saves you, and you don't have anything to say about it, you know. Um, so we know that it's, uh, there's a channel on my YouTube channel uh, that I recommend called Grace Faith 08. And uh, the, the pastor said they named the church Grace Faith is because grace is God's part of the equation, and faith is our part. God is gracious to give us salvation freely. We receive it as a free gift, but through faith. So it is, right, it is... Um, uh, both both required. God has a part and we have a part, but uh, our part is not works or providing our own righteousness. Our part is just trusting Jesus. 
All right, very good. Um, let me take just a moment to kind of sum up a couple of key points that I think before we go on. And that is that uh, we not only established that uh, Jesus Christ is eternal, he's not a creature. He did not have a moment where he was created by God Almighty. And um, uh, as, as some of the people believe, particularly some of the cults believe, so he, Jesus is eternal. And we, we all not only determine and prove it that he is eternal, but we, we, I think we all stand on this, that is that uh, he must be eternal in order to be God, because God is eternal. And if Jesus is God, as we believe he is, as the scriptures say, then he must also be eternal. So if someone does not believe in the eternality of Jesus, that he's eternal and doesn't have a, a beginning point of existence, uh, but he was created by God, then that is... Uh, uh, that is of the utmost seriousness, and that's why I have on my statement of faith. In the flesh as the Son of God. Okay, let's move on now. Um, now, I'm going to ask Brother Bill if it's possible. I'm not sure Sam or Joe have notes in front of them. Uh, I've, I'm sure I've sent everybody the file that has all my notes for the study. It's quite exhaustive and extensive notes. But uh, as I go through these points and we discuss them, uh, if, if possible, maybe Bill could like post each one of these points in the uh, comment bar here for the, everybody else's benefit. If you can do that, please do it, Bill. Otherwise, uh, yeah, yeah, I can. If you let us know whereabouts we are in the notes, I can post them. I'm going to show you where we're starting right now. If you scroll down to uh, where it says um, eternality of Christ, John 1, 1 through 3, and then you keep going down beyond that to where it says point E, F, and then right after point F, we're going to begin with point G. If you, can you find it? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'll post point G in, in the chat bar so everyone can know, right? Okay, very good. All right, so I'm gonna read this. Now the point that we made is that uh, uh, Jesus is eternal, and now we're gonna just look at some of the historical theologians that many people respect. Some of these theologians we may actually have some big disagreements with, but at least this is what they say about uh, the eternality of Jesus. Uh, some great theologians had this to say about the eternality of God. A.W. Tozer, quote, In God there, there is no was or will be, but a continuous and unbroken is. In him history and prophecy are one and the same. Whatever God is, his is infinitely. Whew, that's a pretty profound statement there. Uh, very profound. Uh, let me get your reaction to that, please. Uh, well, whoever wants to go first, I don't want to call on you. Whoever feels like they have something to say about it, just feel free to speak first. Well, I, I, I could, oh, sorry, yeah, I'm just going to say I, I can only just read and for that, just agree with, you know, what, what he said and what he's quoted. Yeah, I, I would also agree. Tozer was a great mind. Uh, but additionally, what we're doing here has been long neglected. And, and I'm so sad to see that, that uh, the, the church, the body in general, has not taken more interest in this issue. Uh, there are verses that cause people to stumble if they don't study and they don't take things in context like Christ being the firstborn of all creation, just it throws some people into a real tailspin because they're not taking things in context and looking at the totality of Scripture. And a lot of the statements like Tozer just made here are profound and common and vague. And uh, I, I just I love the fact that we're actually studying to uh, know God better and to understand Christ better and I think there's a real need for us to dig deeper into the Trinity, into the three persons, personalities, within the one God. And so I'm just uh, glad we're doing this. Yeah, it's, uh, 
I, I agree how important this subject is and neglected it is. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to analyze this A.W. Tozer quote here. And Brother Sam, I'd like to get your your take on it. But it, to me, it's just blowing me away. But the whole concept of time boggles my mind anyway. It's, it always has. You know, when I think of timing, my mind gets like twisted up into a pretzel trying to figure time out. Uh, Brother Sam, what do you say about a Tozer's yeah. quote? I'm just getting to um, to the to my computer desk and just looking through the side chat and reading through it right now. But uh, but as far as eternal is concerned, uh, I mean it, it means um, lasting or existing forever without end or beginning. So. That means without cause, you know, God is without cause. A lot of people, they may say, like, hey, where God is from? <laughs> you know, they may ask that sort of question, but, um, hey, God is eternal. God is uncaused and everlasting and Existing forever without end or beginning, you know. So, but I'm going to read through what uh, what has been pasted on the chat area as well. Okay, all right. Uh, this is uh, the part that really is amazing to me. Uh, in God, there is no was or will be, but a continuous and unbroken is. So, in other words, it sounds like he's saying God is present tense all the time. And then he goes on to say, in him, history and prophecy are one and the same. Okay, Brother Bill, give me another shot at, at, at seeing if you want to uh, comment on that at all, or does it just speak for itself? Well, I think it's a lot that it is. In God, there is no was or will be. I know the scriptures say, you know, that, that God is, you know, from, from eternally past to future. But God is so beyond time, being the creator of time itself, he's not restrained or, or constrained in any any way whatsoever. So God is beyond time. So yeah, there could never be a you know <laughs> a was or will be in that sense. You know, he's always going to be continuous and unbroken. Is you know, God is, I am the I am. He is, yeah, spot on. What do you think it means when he says, in him history and prophecy are one and the same? Well, it's like you said, Luke, when you when you start and consider uh, things that, uh, like time, time does turn your head into a pretzel. It's got to. <clears throat> to understand uh, the eternality of God, we would have to be God. I mean that's a that's a, a, a attribute of omniscience. We just don't we don't have the noodle for it. But uh, one thing we can do is apprehend what we can, and and I apprehend that that uh, in the beginning God created time for our benefit. He when he created this universe in the beginning, time began. Uh, before then, there time was not there because there was no friction or no no universal pull of gravity that affects time and here on earth time is different than it is on Mars and time on the distant planets are different than time on earth also uh, it's it, it relates to gravity and motion and mass and so uh, it, it's it's hard for us to fathom not having an essential of our being I mean how do you imagine not having an essential and so all I can say is is that I do believe that there were ages and events before what we know as time started and I also know that God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, live in time and outside of time it says that he will in the in the eternity to come he will step in to his creation and put his throne on the, in the New Jerusalem from, all, from there, his glory will fill the universe, and he will be in time. But at the same time, he's omniscient. He's a, 
out of time, uh, above time also. I don't think we'll ever know that. I don't think when we get to heaven we'll understand that. But uh, it's it's exciting to try to apprehend what we can from what he's given us, like we are today. Yeah, I just wanted to know, I forgot to say it earlier, sorry, my apologies, but, you know, what is interesting is that, that time is measured by light, and Jesus Christ himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? and he describes himself as the light of the world. So, if light is comparable to time, that's how we distinguish it, Christ himself is saying that he is the light. He's indicating there that he is the creator of time itself. And, and we know that that, that that Jesus, it says in Hebrews 13, 8, it says, you know, that, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, he's unchangeable. He is time itself in that respect, if that makes sense. And uh, if I want to add, uh, it's... You know, like <laughs> you know, when 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 God said, uh, "Let there be light," you know, and we know when He created time, space, and matter. Matter. Um, time is like, you know, it has beginning and end. You know, so certainly time is not eternal. Time itself is not eternal. For example, imagine, look up and draw a line. You know, one. Imagine a line that you are drawing in the space, and that line would represent humanity. That's time. It has the beginning and end, and it has certain representation called humanity. Within that humanity, one of your time, your life, is there. The rest of, you know, other space, I, I have no comprehension, but only God knows. <laughs> but in God's eyes, that humanity, that line already is drawn. You know? So, in that sense, Time is meaningless for God because it already happened <laughs> and already happening. <laughs> so <laughs> it's I, uh, interesting. I think I, I think I mentioned this uh, one of the previous talk uh, discussions on this. Uh, the the best thing that I can do is actually picture this or describe it. Time and God is that if, if I had a reel to reel camera. Uh, I mean, film, and let's say there's 10,000 little pictures, and by rolling it fast, it looks like it's moving. But each one is an individual picture, and we were to just stretch out the whole reel linear in a linear way, and it's all stretched out before me, and I'm looking at it. I'm not in that, but I can see the first one, the middle one, the last. I can see them all at the same time, and to me, that's kind of what it says here. In God, there is no is no was or will be, but a continuous and broken is. In Him, history and prophecy are one and the same. That's the only way I can imagine to like picture this, and I'm not sure it's really a good way of doing it, but it's the best that I can think of. Um, but we know that time uh, was not is not eternal, because God created all things. If if time was always there, then God wouldn't have created time. So at some point, if God created time, it, it, it wasn't with him uh, through all, all eternity. All right, let's go to Nick. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, yeah, I was going to say, because this is a, such a deep subject, even talking about this time now, that, you know, as humans, we fathom time, as Sam Rolfe you said, as a straight line, a beginning and an end. But could you imagine trying to comprehend time, not as a straight line from beginning to end, but as a circle? Continual and eternal. That that's mind blowing. That one. Yeah, it's uh, it does. It boggles my mind. Uh, I'm going to read the next quote. By this. my opinion. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, brother. Oh well, you know, just a thought that I had. You know, um, 
I think we, that the 6,000 year is almost the end, and uh, I think this we're about to enter the 7,000 years, the millennium. But uh, what I'm saying is, like, you know how God created uh, the whole creation in six days, and a lot of people represent that as a um, thousand years. For example, like, uh, uh, like in total 6,000 year human history, for example, since the creation. And uh, when Christ comes, uh, there will be a millennium reign. Uh, which is like a resting period, uh, how God rested the seventh day. Um, so that's kind of symbolically representative as well. Uh, it's not just being circular, but it's linear, has one end and has the end. Um, you know, if it is circular, then I don't know who's providing that energy uh, to go with that uh, time go around. So again, we are restricted within the eternity, and um, we are uh, once in, one way or the other, it's going to run out. So I think it has also the end as far as time is concerned. When uh, Brother Bill said maybe time's not linear but it's circular and what he did was uh, years ago I, I had to have brain surgery and I think Bill just kind of like did another brain surgery on me then when he said that because it just it, my mind can't comprehend that at all <laughs> alright the next uh, theologian that we're going to look at his take on this is Stephen Charnock now some of the people watching when we mention someone's name uh, I found that a lot of people make a mistake when uh, you reference a theologian that uh, you might say well that person was wrong on this or that and, and uh, therefore you can't listen to anything they said and I think this is a, a erroneous way of thinking because uh, just because someone is wrong on one part of theology and maybe seriously wrong maybe critically wrong on one thing it doesn't mean they can't have something else very right. Uh, like for example, uh, I look at the Roman Catholic religion and I think they're critically wrong uh, in some ways, uh, but uh, aren't they right on the resurrection for example? Aren't they right on the virgin birth for example? Um, so they, you know, it's possible that one of these people we're quoting here, they're uh, uh, we can learn something from what they say, but you, you might. But if you want to say, "Hey, uh, that person's a Calvinist, or that person's a Roman Catholic, or this or that," well, well I don't like Romanism and I don't like Calvinism, but it doesn't mean that everything that ever came out of their mouth was wrong. <laughs> okay, so now we're looking. I don't know anything about this guy, Stephen Charnock. Quote: The eternity of God is nothing else but the duration of God, and the duration of God is nothing else but his existence enduring." Unquote. It is indeed a high and holy mystery to contemplate oh, something happened. Uh, it's jumped ahead. Uh, when I, read, I better read it off my notes because when I read it there, if someone makes a comment, then it jumps out of place. So let me find it. Okay. Uh, it is indeed a high and holy mystery to contemplate that God existed before he created anything. Time dwells within God. He causes, affects, and controls it, and yet does so without time exerting any control or hold on him. Everything about God is, quote, always, unquote, and I am, unquote. Uh, no hourglass can be turned over for the creator of time, for he is not subject to time. Uh, now I do see a discrepancy between what he said and an earlier theologian said, I, I, I backed up a minute ago talking about how uh, we, someone we talked about last week, he, he made the point that if God uh, did uh, created all things, including time, then God time could not have been existing eternally. Uh, otherwise God didn't create time. 
Uh, but this person, he, he's saying, in, the, in this case, he's saying that time dwells within God. So if time dwells within God, then I would say that time would be eternal. So, But I'm not sure. Uh, well, we got two different points of view as far as I can see on that. What's your uh, reaction to that, Saints? Yeah, it actually does. This, this, I've never heard of him myself personally, but the, the, the Stephen Sherlock made the same point that I did earlier, that, that Christ is always and that I am. So he's made that point, and, and I suppose he's, he's expounded and expressed what I was saying probably better, because he's obviously a theologian of, of some description, you know, that, that you know, he is time in itself. Time is within him, that makes sense. Maybe not time as we understand it, but time in essence and in substance of that such a thing is within God, within Christ. So yeah, I think I'm grasping Stephen to know what what he's saying, you know, quite well because that's the similar vein that I was, you know, expressing earlier. Might not have come out as good as what he did because I'm not a I'm not a super theologian. I'm just a humble man. But I think well, how he's expressed it there is 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 quite excellent. Yeah, I, I not to not to throw cold water on on what the guy has said. Uh, I don't know him either. Uh, I kind of prefer a uh, humble thought to uh, philosophical uh, dwell, you know, whimsical dwellings. Anyway, I I think what he's doing here strikes me a little bit as pantheistic. Uh, that uh, all is God, all is in God. Uh, uh, God is in all things. Uh, you know, the bacteria that's on my arm that I just whacked is part of God. I think that there is a definite distinction that this guy misses between creator and creation. And while he created us to be eternal beings with a beginning and no end, uh, we are not a part of God. We are not part of the I am. We are distinct and outside of God, as, as is shown by our uh, decision whether or not to come into union with God and to be with him eternally. There is a significant portion of his creation that will choose to be outside of God for all eternity. And I'm not saying burn in torturous you know, surroundings. I'm saying they will choose by default not to have a relationship with God and he will honor that. And they were for, forever be outside of God. And so I think what this guy is saying, uh, while on one level makes sense, on another level seems rather pantheistic and uh, and not in line with, with the teachings of the Scripture. That's, that's why I suppose we've got to glean truth out of this, because obviously we have, thanks be to God, we have the Scriptures, so we can compare whatever he says with the scriptures, yeah, and I understand what you're just saying. If if you look at at it just as it is, without the scriptures to back it up, you could say it's pantheist, yeah. But with with scriptures in mind, you can you can squeeze it and fit it in if it makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense, Bill. And and maybe I'm just being overly, uh, maybe you know, breaking the microscope out instead of uh, just looking at it uh, as it is. But I, I, I have recently been dealing with, with uh, pantheists, and it's important to make the distinction between the creator and the creation, and uh, I don't think he did that enough to suit me in this statement. Yeah, and good points. Uh, see, I had a guy years ago, I had a home buddy style Bible study at my house for years, and um, uh, there was a couple of individuals over the years that objected to ever re referencing um, um, commentaries. And I had a lot of commentaries by various theologians. This was before I had access to this all this great stuff on the internet where we have all these like Bible Hub and Bible Gateway and stuff. And so it's right at our fingertips. Uh, but back then I just had books. I had to look up something. But uh, this person uh, didn't like that. And uh, it was my opinion. I said, look, there's five of us at the table just having a Bible study now. And right here in this setting, there's four of us, right? Each one of us is actually a theologian. I don't know if you've 
consider yourself a theologian of the past or not, but I, I consider us all theologians. Uh, and, and, you know, some of us are more learned and some of us are less learned. But, and, and some of us are, you know, think we're learned, but we're, we're, we're just not, not, we don't know as much as we think we do. But I, I think it's valuable for me to, instead of just trying to figure this out privately on my own with the scriptures, which I, I love to do, but if I can have someone else with me, now I have three other saints with me, and we're trying to figure something out together, then uh, I, I, there, I have a better chance of understanding something. It's going to be helpful uh, having the ideas of these three theologians with me today. And it's the same thing when I open up a book and, and read Tozier or Spurgeon or somebody like that and, and get their viewpoint. It's like they're sitting in the Bible study with this right now. So right here we have this guy. Uh, these guys, uh, what, what are they? Uh, Tozer and the other one was Charnock. We got Spurgeon coming up next. It's like they're here with us in the Bible study to a certain extent, and we're getting their input too. Now, uh, so I, I, to me, I just think it's very valuable and helpful. I've always liked to get a, a lot of different opinions on things and then try to analyze it all and see if I can come to a conclusion or not. Sam, okay, go ahead, Bruce. Look, what, in what other forum can I spank a famous theologian and not get hit back? This is wonderful. <laughs> Uh, very true. Very true. You're too. You're too far away to smack right now. <laughs> okay, brother Sam. Uh, anything on this before we move on to Spurgeon's comment? Okay, maybe he had to step away. I'm going to reach a comment by C. H. Spurgeon now. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This is another person that. Uh, uh, many people absolutely put up on the highest pedestal uh, in respect, and then other people despise him because they thought he was a Calvinist, and uh, maybe he was to some certain extent. But I don't, I don't, from what I understand of him, he he wasn't a Calvinist the way I think of Calvinists. Uh, but C. H. Spurgeon says, "Quote: God's nature is without beginning and without end, free from all succession of time." God dwells in eternity. Eternity is not just, quote, extended time, unquote, but rather is existence above and apart from time. God contains in himself the cause of time. Time has no control over God, and he does not have to work within the strictures of time unless he so pleases. Being eternal, he is free to bestow eternality on his creation in his good pleasure. All of God's attributes bask in his eternality. Since eternity neither wears out nor runs out, neither do his attributes. Okay. I just want to, yeah, just want to pick up on a point. And he is in the similar vein that, that, that Charnock was. And I am that, that that Christ has time within Himself. Yeah, He make He makes that point as well, doesn't He? He says, you know, God in Himself, the cause of time. You know, in Himself. You know, so He created time from within Himself. You know, I think that's that's something that's for me personally it is 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 striking, uh, and that that I've been noticing. Also, also. Brother Spurgeon did get saved just a little way away from my house, not far in a little chapel. I just thought I'd quickly say that. He got saved in my hometown, just around the corner from me, and, and he was born just, just up the road from me. So, yeah, he's an Essex lad like me, so I've got to pick him up a bit. Well, I would, I would dispute what Bill just said. Uh, I would dispute that in that, uh, I believe we have to make the, the, the separation between creature and creation. I know I just went over this before, but I think it's so important. Uh, all is not in God, all is not God, all, all is not of God because of free choice. Uh, I think that time is a creation, a creation of God, but not within God rather apart from God. Now he can step in and step out of his creation, but I do think it is a distinct and separate 
creation apart from the creator. The creator has control over all things, but not necessarily is in and of all things. Uh, and I, I think Lucifer and, and the fall of man and, uh, uh, and the fig trees that bear no fruit that he burns all have uh, evidence of this. And uh, uh, so, and, and it says distinctly that it, when people are separated from God, they will not be in his presence. That doesn't mean he doesn't have control over whatever situation they're in, but he will not be a part of it as far as his essence or nature is concerned. And so I just want to keep drawing that line, if I can, uh, in the differential between creature and creation. Yeah, I see. I agree. There is difference between create and creation. Perhaps I'm not wording it right, and I'm not coming across right. Try and uh, try and understand it as God is the catalyst in that sense. That that within Him it is time and matter. He has released it according to His good will and pleasure, and it has come into existence. So time itself. Christ isn't time himself in that sense because time was created by the Creator, who we know is Christ and the Father and the Holy Ghost. But he is a catalyst, he releases it from himself because he created all things. If that makes that sense. Makes, yeah, that makes sense, Bill. I, I get I get what you're saying now. And that was something we had just touched on right before we finished last week. Where does all this stuff the the molecules and the the, the the stuff that makes this cup come from does God just speak it into existence, or was is it something that that came out of Him? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a whole other uh, mind blower there for me. Anyway, the more I think about it, the more my head hurts. So, yeah, I see what you're saying. I just love well, to no, be no, that's fine because that, you know iron sharp and fine, but and, and it is good, you know, because sometimes and, and we make the point often, don't we? that two or three people are saying exactly the same thing, but from a different angle, and sometimes there's conjecture and there's issues when there shouldn't be. But it's good that we're open on this panel and that we can we can, we can can sort it out, you know, here and now, so we know we're, we're reading from the same hymn sheet, that makes sense. Yeah, for all the, the uh, in, it says, in the beginning, you know, in the, in the beginning implies there is a beginning, and if there is a beginning, that means at some point, time has create, been created. So, mm -hmm. in the beginning, time. <laughs> in the beginning, God. Yeah. Uh, I would say that um, uh, I think I was the guy that stirred up uh, this problem in the last discussion, saying that uh, I didn't want to be thought of as a pantheist, but where did matter and energy and everything come from? I mean. If there was nothing, if God created everything, then where did it come from? Did it come out of God? But if it came out of God, could it, some people construe that as being that it is God, like my table here, my computer is God, the tree is God, the rocks are God. No, just because it came out of God doesn't mean it is God. That would be pantheism. Uh, but where did matter, energy, all that stuff come from? So um, now we have two different things here we got we just listened to uh, we listened to um, let me see brother Tozer we listened to we listened to brother Charnock and we listened to brother Spurgeon and uh, brother Cuthbert all kind of making that same point about um, God uh, time being within God and then Brother Joe was at the center about uh, possible pantheistic uh, point of view there. But let's, I'm going to go back just for a moment to this, what we covered earlier. There's another person, I don't even know who to quote on this, but this is what he said. He said, um, man lives in temporal time or time that has limits both past and future. Everything in temporal time is measured from a point of reference, past, present, future, before, after. Simultaneous, always, later, next year, forever, at 6 p.m., etc. Time requires limits, but God has no limits. God exists outside of time. God's eternality entails that he has always existed and always will exist, that he has no beginning and no end. Therefore, temporal terms have no significant application to God. If God existed in time, 
when he created all, there would be one thing that he did not create. That is time. Um, so um, his point really is that uh, t there could not be any time until it was created. So these are different points of view, and I don't know uh, if we're going to ever figure it out completely, but it's just like uh, I don't even want to wrestle with this. The, just the basic question of uh, uh, if uh, everything had a beginning, but God didn't have a beginning, where did God come from? You know, I mean, we, we don't even want to try to put our brains around that right now, but this whole discussion of time, that's what it causes. It causes your, our minds to just like get twisted up, and I, I, I don't think we're going to figure it out. Hey, let me welcome St. Tommy. Hi. Hey, sir. Thank you for your hospitality. It's good to see all, all of you. Yeah, St. Tommy, have you been uh, following this? The last, uh, uh, now we're in our fifth hour of discussing this subject. It's probably going to go on for 10 or 20 hours, I imagine. But um, uh, have you followed it much up to this point? Um, um, unfortunately, uh, about five minutes of it before I arrived. Okay, well, you, you can pick up right where we are. But basically, yeah. we, we've, we've basically declared that... that uh, uh, God, one attribute of God is eternality, not having a beginning. And, uh, and Jesus is God, therefore Jesus must also be eternal. We, we, we are stating that this is a core doctrine of Christianity, the, that Jesus is God, eternal God Almighty. And, but we're going to go into, as we go along, what does it mean, eternal? How did Jesus exist before the Incarnation? But that's coming up later, okay? You're kind of caught up now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I've got a lot of notes I'm referring to, and I'm just getting everybody's feedback as I go through these notes here. So let me go to the next part here. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, the next one I'm going to quote is Norman Geisler. And he says, quote, The Bible declares that God is eternal. He was before time, and he created time. Hence, he cannot be a part of time. Though he can relate to time as its creator in the way a cause relates to its effect. So it seems like Geisler is on that side of this question that uh, time did not exist within God. As that seems to contradict what Spurgeon was saying and that uh, Charnoff said. Well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in total disagreement with, uh, with Norman, Norm Geisler. I love Norm Geisler, first of all, let me say, I really think he's a, a great mind, but in this instance, I, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, the, the scripture clearly tells us that God will step into time and, and uh, reign from the New Jerusalem throughout eternity, spreading his Shekinah glory throughout the universe. He will be in time by his choosing and at the same time be outside of time in his essence probably I get that part but uh, I think Geisler makes a mistake in in uh, in putting Christ or putting God outside of time when he clearly states he will step into time yeah, okay, I'm, I'm a, oh, let me I'm see one thing real quick first uh, this is uh, just in terms of uh, procedure here uh, St. Tommy uh, when you when you're talking have your mic on but if you're not talking just mute it uh, that way we don't get any feedback okay all right thanks go ahead brother Bill yeah I think I'm just going to agree with what, what, what brother Joe just said there you know although it's difficult to grasp of all the other people you know Spurgeon and the like which have quoted but I've grasped the, the, the basic understanding and the vein of what they're saying and I have to, like I said, with Brother Joe, I have to degree, you know, disagree with with with, with Geisler on this one, because I, I believe he is is limiting Christ and limiting, you know, that that as Brother Joe said, that that Christ can step in and out of time as he so pleases. He's not constrained or he's not restrained by like we are. And I think that perhaps Geisler is trying to restrain him in some way. And, and so I'd have to disagree with that, yeah. All right, St. Tommy, do you have anything to want to say up to this point? Yeah, it seems like to me that Christ Jesus somehow 
is in time, right here on the cusp of time, in us, you know, whether we feel him uh, somehow via the Holy Spirit, but uh, that, and also that Christ Jesus definitely entered time, you know, back when he was uh, at the virgin birth, the incarnation. Um, so yeah, it seems to me to ring to ring true that that God enters time and that He is here now, even in us. Uh, know ye not, brothers, that you are temples of God or a temple of God? Mm. Um, yeah, to think that He is not somehow very interfaced with us right now. You know, I, it, that doesn't make sense to me to, to, that he is not. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting take. Let me let me say that um, Norman Geisler, as Joe said, uh, he respects him, admires him. I, I do too. Norman Geisler has done some of the greatest things I've ever teachings I've ever seen with his great grasp of, of science and, and the universe and uh, and theology. Uh, so, but that just shows you there, there's not one person. I mean, if, if I was to go to every person on the panel and we, and I asked 20 theological questions, uh, we're gonna, well, I, you might, I might find one of you that even agrees on me 15 or 16 of them probably. But there's going to be some theological subjects and think conclusions we come to that are different than than the other. Uh, and and this is true with to Tozier and Spurgeon and Geisler and and uh, Saint Tommy and Brother Bill and all of us. So that's just the way it is, and that's why it's so important for us to uh, say, okay, we agree on these most important core doctrines, and then the other stuff, let's discuss it and try to learn and figure it out together, and not insult each other and <laughs> get, get angry with each other. But my getting back to this point, the. Uh, uh, the idea of not being part of time, as Norman Geisler said, uh, we know that God became part of time, at least when he walked with Adam and Eve. We know that the, the what were called theophanies or Christophanies, these examples of God becoming a man and appearing different times throughout history. Uh, I won't go into all those examples right now, but these are uh, examples of God entering uh, even before the, the incarnation of Jesus, uh, and we know the incarnation of Jesus, God entered our time. But then there's the other question: Is what about the attribute of God that we call omnipresence? I mean, if God is omnipresent, doesn't he doesn't he have to be even in the time, out of time, everywhere? <laughs> I'll, I'll let you guys jump on that one. I, I, Bill, Bill, I want to I want to address that from something I, I was thinking about. It, this is interesting to me. Uh, I was just contemplating, as I often do, uh, our eternity. And, and it talks about, uh, you know, all of us saints will be bodily, physically, in, in eternity in, on the new earth. And there's only one, uh, one Christ. And, and yet there will be, hopefully, several billion uh, people. And how does he make his physical presence known or fellowship? with billions of people. And I was considering the fact that Jesus Christ, being 100% man and 100% God, I wonder, my imagination sees Jesus Christ manifesting himself physically in millions of locations at the same time. In other words, he's omnipresent, yet he's flesh and blood, flesh and bone. And wouldn't it be neat if Christ manifested in bodily form in millions of places at any one time throughout eternity? And uh, that's how he has fellowship. I mean, you could actually expect a knock on your door uh, one night next week in the eternal city, and it's Jesus Christ there. And, and yet he's in a million other locations at the same time. It, it's one of those things that I was dwelling on that actually pretzeled my mind, like you say. All right. Anybody else before we move on from Norman Geisler? Now I think we covered Norman Geisler, but I think I think Joe's got a similar sort of brain to me. I think we think too much. I'm sure, but I, you know, when you go deep, then I have to go deeper, and it just the, 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 
it never ends, but yeah, that's that's how we work at it. Yeah, let me let me say before we move on that uh, you know when I uh, before I started this uh, broadcast, I put out a public uh, invitation to join the panel, provided provided that you agree with the core doctrines of Christianity. Uh, and so, if, if someone wants to join and doesn't even adhere to these then uh, they can't be part of this discussion. So that's not the purpose of this. This is for fellowship among the saints and for us to uh, figure out the uh, these uh, difficult theological questions together. So that yeah, that's an explanation if someone uh, wanted to get on and you're not able to. Okay, so let me move into the next uh, point. This one is Warren Wearsby. Quote, there is a difference between being immortal and being eternal. Man is immortal. That is, his soul will never die. But God is eternal. He has neither beginning nor ending. Okay, I, I think that's a very interesting point. I do have to disagree with a certain aspect of it, but we will be able to, uh, I, I want to get your feedback before I interject. Let me first welcome, uh, uh, let me see, my teacher of the Bible, Brother Jack Coon, Coons, right? Are you there? I'm here. Okay, Brother Jack, uh, I want to first introduce you and, and uh, ask you, are, have you uh, been following what we're doing up to any, do you have any idea what we're talking about yet? Yeah, as a, as a matter of fact, I was listening to the, uh, to the uh, other previous uh, ones that you had, as you had suggested, and then I was, I missed the beginning of it, I was just doing something else, and I just came on and I caught the last few minutes of you talking about the theophanies and it's literally taking me this long to get to try to get into uh, my computer. Acts a little slow sometimes, and I heard you commenting about the theophanies and how when uh, Jesus was uh, or during these theophanies of how he could be omnipresent. And I was trying to get in during that whole time, so I finally made it. Okay, I'm glad you're in. This is probably about the largest capacity I like in the Hangout, just because. Uh, if you have too many people, it takes too long for each person to get a chance to talk. I, I don't want each individual to have to wait an hour before they get a turn. So I want to limit it to this of uh, people here now. And if anybody else wants to join, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, so this is the question. Um, there is a difference between immor being immortal and being eternal. Man is immortal. That is, his soul will never die. But God is eternal. He has neither beginning nor ending. Let me get everybody's uh, reaction to that. I don't think it's 100% correct, but let me uh, see what you guys say here. Let's start with Brother Bill. Uh, Bill had to take a, a bathroom break, uh, I believe. Uh, also, let me say that uh, to Brother Jack, um, when you're obviously we want you to talk, we want your input, but when you're not talking, Brother, please mute the mic. That, that way we don't get the feedback. Okay, we'll start with Brother uh, Joe. Well, I, I, I see exactly what you're what you're talking about, uh, Luke. He he says that uh, we are immortal but not eternal. Uh, the Bible teaches that we will have everlasting life, and I don't know if I'm picking at uh, little things, but if we have everlasting life and and we have eternal life, it says that also. Scriptures are are uh, interpreted or translated to say we have eternal life. I take the word of God as it is and so we are eternal he created us to be eternal and uh, so uh, those of us who who do accept the gospel and have come into relationship with with God I believe do have eternality from a beginning on in other words we do have a beginning but no ending and that's one of the great uh, promises of, of the gospel Okay, uh, Brother Joe, I'll just interject this before I get everybody else's uh, ideas on this. Uh, the distinction he's drawing is a, is a distinction that I'm familiar with, and that is that immortality means that you'd have a beginning, but you have no ending. Eternality means you have neither beginning nor ending. So that's the point that he's making. Oh, well, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so you agree with that. Uh, I, I'm going to probably be at the center in a certain extent, but I'm going to save it to the end. I want to get to each person's kind of reaction to that. Uh, St. Tommy, you have some opinion on this? Yeah, um, it's kind of foggy to me, but it seems that as I think about it, that that I 
as a being have a beginning but no ending now that you know uh, I've been given by grace eternal life our Christ Jesus um, I'm not I don't really uh, I've heard some some people discourse about pre-existence but I don't haven't beheld much in scripture to support a pre-existence not much so um, past that I don't really uh, I'm not sure what points he's making to tell you the truth why there's a distinction this is a little bit unclear unless maybe he's promoting pre-existence in some way hmm. okay uh, brother Jack yeah um I uh first of all I think that uh you have the the immortality I agree with you what you said about the you know this this uh, mortality shall put on immortality first Corinthians 15 uh everlasting uh like John 3:16 but have everlasting life we do have a beginning but we will have no end because uh we when we put on that immortality however I think what the separation is, and I mean, I, I'm allowed to be wrong, uh, but um, I'm not saying I'm always right. But my understanding is that because we are placed in Christ, and He is eternal, that is how we have internal. That is how we have uh, eternality. It is not through any power of our own, but it's because we're placed in Him that we become eternal. If that makes any sense to you, and that's the only difference, we and ourselves, uh, we're just everlasting. Our life has a start. Our life would then, in Christ, not have an end, but it's in Him. Uh, th there's where you have the eternality, but not of ourselves. And if that makes any sense to you, yeah. Okay. So uh, so far, it seems like everybody's in agreement that uh, God has neither beginning or ending. Uh, man does have a beginning, and uh, we have no ending to our life because of our faith in Jesus we have everlasting life okay so let's uh, go on to brother Sam or oh yeah brother Sam's next yeah um, I, I also do agree as well uh, and also I'd like to uh, expound on that a little bit more anything has anything that has a beginning has a cause and when we observe um, whatever around us, anything uh, which has beginning has a cause or two. Um, whereas God being God being eternal, He doesn't actually require uh, any cause. Uh, so I think that's the difference. Uh, that cause is is the difference between God and, and man as well. Uh, whatever the cause might be, I believe that is Jesus Christ. But uh, you know, I think maybe that's another subject. All right, thank you. And brother Bill, are you back yet? Okay. Um, all right, here I'm going to draw a distinction, separate myself from everybody, unless unless you just you you agree with me, but you didn't say it. I doubt that's the case. Um, the I, I, of course I agree that all of us who put our faith in Jesus, we have everlasting life, we have immortality. But uh, I did an exhaustive teaching on this. It's in my records if you want to go look at it and it's, the concept is called conditional immortality and uh, I've become to believe that uh, man is not born with an immortal soul the verse that brother Jack quoted it says that we were immortal and we put on immortality and and when we believe in Jesus we receive the gift of eternal life but um, the, the point is that most people think and this is not just in Christendom, but all, all religions, they, they think that man has an immortal soul. And so after he dies, his soul has to spend an eternity somewhere. 
And, and of course, we who put our faith in Jesus will have an eternity in the kingdom of God and the new heavens and new earth. And those people who did not put their faith in Jesus, they've got to spend eternity somewhere since their soul's immortal, and therefore they've got to go to eternal torment and, and spend eternity there because their soul is immortal. Uh, but I believe that we are not born with immortal souls. We only receive immortality when we put our faith in Jesus. Now, I'm not going to go into that right now because uh, that's not the whole subject of this discussion. Uh, you can go to my uh, playlist called Conditional Immortality and Eternal Torment, and you can see uh, how, what I've said on that. Uh, but that's where I draw the distinction. Yeah, um, man uh, is has a beginning and an end, but we don't have an end because we received eternal life from Jesus Christ. God has no beginning and he has no ending. So that's the point. Uh, I'll give everybody a chance to make a quick uh, reaction to that before we move on, if you like. Is uh, Brother Bill back yet? Okay, Brother Joe? Uh, just right back to uh, the differential between the creature and the creation, or the creator and the, and the creation. Uh, there is distinction in substance and in uh, attributes. And in every way, so uh, yeah, that, I I think that that draws a, a nice line for us. All right, thank you, brother Saint Tommy. Um, sounds reasonable that uh, a mortal being puts on immoral immortality. Um, a verse comes to mind: "It is appointed man once to live, no, once to die, and then." Uh, face the judgment um, you know that comes to mind uh, but it sounds reasonable that uh, somehow beings who, who have not put on immortality will not continue to exist somewhere that sounds reasonable um, and it's not uh, and I hear you when you say it's not a super prevalent teaching amongst brothers or throughout tradition and uh, uh, but it's an interesting point that that one verse about mortality putting on immortality it sounds reasonable to extrapolate that uh, that human beings who, who don't put on immortality uh, will not spend eternity somewhere it sounds very reasonable plausible Hmm. I got it, Luke. Luke, I've got to interject. How Saint Tommy almost made a slip and said that we we sometimes put on immorality. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, I, I I I thought I noticed that too. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry. That's all right. It, it was uh, good. Uh, yeah, all right. And again, and th this is not the, uh, the the time or place uh, to go into great study on that because uh, that's not the topic for the day. Um, but the point I'm making is that we, we all agree that uh, man has a beginning, and even if I agreed that man has an immortal soul, that means that okay, we have a beginning and then we're immortal. We don't die, but God neither dies nor was born. He's, he has no beginning or ending. Okay, Brother Jack? Uh, yeah, and you have to excuse me. It takes me just a second to get my mouse alive to get my mic turned back on. Um, yeah, I, I uh, the the whole uh, uh, eternal punishment or not is a different subject altogether. But as far as the subject at hand, the eternality of Christ versus ours, uh, yeah, Christ is absolutely uh, uh, the I believe in the absolutely eternal sonship. There, He is eternal, uh, and we're we're obviously starting. We have a starting point somewhere, so we're not. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as the subject of hand goes, I, I, I believe you're absolutely correct. All right, thank don't, you. Don't want to don't want to waste any time barking up a tree that we're not talking about. Yeah, that's right. And if anybody does have any interest in the uh, the other topic, uh, you can go to my playlist on that subject and look at it. And uh, if if I'm wrong, then show me where I'm wrong. Okay, brother Sam. I'm sorry. I'm uh, I'm taking a little uh, little break here outside. Uh, 
so I missed a little portion of this. So what was the question? Uh, I'm going to ask you to respond to this first verse here, the, this next uh, statement I'm going to quote here. It's a new one called doc, uh, Dr. Henry Morris. I, I, again, I don't know who he is, but he said, quote, to the skeptical question as to who made God, the only answer that satisfies all... What's that sound? Somebody, oh, well, I mean... Is it possible to mute that or not? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I think it must have been the wind. Oh, okay, because uh, I couldn't read that with the, the background noise. Hang on, let me finish reading that here. Uh, to the skeptical question as to who made God, the only answer that satisfies all the facts of both science and human reason is that God is, quote, from everlasting, unquote. He is the creator of time as well as space and all things that exist in time and space. This is beyond our mental comprehension, but there is no other rational explanation for our existence. Uh, that was uh, from, uh, oh, he goes on to say, Thus, God was pre-existent to the first record of time, and therefore timeless. I want to look at, at a few verses in order to better get a better comprehension of the incomprehensible. This, <laughs> that is an oxymoron for sure. Eternity is God's signature. It is who he is. Now, the oxymoron, he said, is that I want to look at a few verses in order to get a better comprehension of the incomprehensible. In other words, so if something's incomprehensible, it's beyond our ability to understand, like, how could God have no beginning? How could God have no beginning? Well, let me get your reaction to that, uh, uh, Brother Sam, first. Uh, my reaction to that? I mean... I mean, I mean, do you uh, do you understand? I would like to ask them: Do you understand what eternal means? You know, eternal means basically it has no beginning and end. It means it has no uh, no cause. It has uh, anything that uh, has no beginning and end. That doesn't actually require, even logically, uh, require any. Uh, uh, any explanation? I don't think. Uh, how could <laughs> how could anything that has no cause could be explained? How could anything uh, eternal, such as God, be explained in in in, in our tongue? And that is just impossible. Um, and also, it's, I think it's man's pride even to assess or even try to put the put God in our a, a, a little box, <laughs> but as much as we can understand, and also as much as we can misunderstand about God, what we know about God is actually unlike us. Uh, he doesn't require any cause because he is actually eternal, and whereas we are, as uh, as we have previously discussed. Uh, immortal, uh, uh, who for those who are be who believe in, uh, on Christ. So um, I think that's what I said before. I think the key is actually the cause, and you know, God being eternal, uh, it doesn't really have nor uh, has or nor uh, require any any cause. Let me say before we move to Brother Joe. Um, as as I listen to uh, Brother Sam attempt to explain this, and as I attempt to explain it, it's kind of the inexplainable, inexplicable. I mean, uh, it, it goes along with what we said earlier that let's study more so we can comprehend the incomprehensible. It's an oxymoron. It's incomprehensible. Uh, we Brother Sam says. God is the uncaused cause. Well, it's a wonderful statement, but we can't comprehend it. We can't explain it. We're trying to and proving that we can't. Go to Brother Joe. Well, this this brings up to me a, a, a slight pet peeve I have with with the with the body of Christ and the, with the church uh, throughout time. Uh, we have a tendency to say, "Don't go there." 
well, this is something we just can't figure out. And while those things are true, I also believe that God gave us the word so that we may apprehend what we can't comprehend. You, you're a big fan of Walter Martin, I know, Brother Luke, as am I. And, and he, was, uh, he, he made it quite an impression on me one day when he said we should understand that we can't comprehend anything completely, but we should also strive to apprehend all that God gives us. And that means even though we cannot explain something, we can understand what something is. And, and I think that's what we're doing here. We'll, we'll never be able to comprehend the eternality of God but we can apprehend or understand what he has given us to the fullest degree. And so, uh, yeah, I think we ought to strive to, uh, uh, to understand as much as we can, knowing that to understand all would make us God. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say this. I'm, I'm just letting on back again now. Sorry. All right, so, brother, just, brother yeah. Bill. Since since you're back, I'm going to ask you. But you you missed the point. But just, just here's the question. We 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 say that uh, every, everything that um, has a beginning has a cause, and, and and God has no beginning. He's the he's the uncaused cause. God is eternal, no beginning, no no ending. And this is what we're trying to comprehend. And this theologian says we're trying to let's study more so we can comprehend the incomprehensible. Well, if it's incomprehensible, it's an oxymoron. We can't comprehend it. It's inexplicable. We're trying to comprehend it. We're trying to explain it as best we can. And I agree with Brother Joe. Uh, just because it's really difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't make an attempt. Maybe we can understand it better, but not completely. Okay, uh, uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah. I just want to agree with what you just said. And I suppose this is where faith has to kick in because we, we cannot explain the unexplainable you know God's God's ways are way above our ways and some of the things that he does and, and is created and, and, and continues to do are unfathomable and that's why we've got to put faith you know yeah we might not understand it but we believe it to be true and, and I think that's where you know it's a blessing really you know to have faith in something that we cannot understand and not even clearly see Mm -hmm. Yeah, I made a video about faith and uh, the called faith faith the one requirement, and I'm trying to make the point that um, and try to understand why God seems to have such a great place a great value on faith. Uh, Jesus, you said it, it's it, it's we're more blessed if we don't see and touch God as uh, Thomas did. But and yet believe in him. I've never seen Jesus or touched him, but I believe in him. I have faith. And and Jesus said, We are blessed somehow because of that. And um, without faith it is impossible to please God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and so on. All these things we're trying to understand about faith, God seems to, for some reason, really value this trust or faith uh, that we we only have the scriptures. Thank God for the scriptures. Can I interject here, yeah. Brother Wade? I, I just want to interject that many times the Bible tells us, study, study, study. Seek the deeper things of God. Uh, grow past your milk. I mean, it, 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 it really wants us, the Bible tells us to explore and seek deep things. Never once does the Bible say, don't consider this. Uh, just, hey, let this go and just have faith. Faith is an evidence of things unseen. And and so that God God values that also. And I, I just think that it, we're all always admonished and encouraged to study the deeper things and to, and to seek, seek, seek. And never once are we to just say, oh, well, I don't want to explore that. I just have faith that God is real. Well, faith is valued. It's valued as an evidence, not as a standard. Amen. We're uh, uh, this. We we were supposed to study. We must have faith. 
we can't understand everything and then of course that's when we really need to rely on our faith as brother bill bill said but that doesn't mean that uh, we're supposed to have blind faith without uh, as as the uh, 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 Luke said that uh, these are not de de uh, cleverly devised schemes you know these are and th these there's evidence to support these claims in the scriptures about the death burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, that, so the people who first believed, and even us who believe now, we are not just blindly believing. Someone just tells you something and then you just believe it. But no, we're supposed to be as the Bereans, study and see if it is so. Okay, let's go to St. Tommy. Um, uh, thank you. I have uh, uh, nothing to add at this time, but thank you. Thank you, brother. And uh, St. Jack. Well, I haven't been called Saint Jack in a long time. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, I got to throw this in there, brother Luke. Uh, I was real good friends with the late uh, Doctor uh, Matthew. What was his last name? Uh, Brewer. He was a former Catholic priest, and uh, they got saved. And he, when he would go into a church, he would say, "Well." Uh, he'd look over at the preacher and say, well, hello, St. Leslie. And he, and then when people would kind of look at him, he'd go, well, we are saints, aren't we? And uh, so <laughs> he had to just play that to the nth degree. But uh, now that I've said that, you know, the thing is on, on, on this uh, thing of faith and searching the scriptures, yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, Joe, Sebastian, uh, whichever he prefers. Um, you know, we are commanded to study. We are commanded to search the scriptures. Uh, to learn of him that's the whole idea is to learn of Christ and uh, to learn who he is and and to learn what he is and the, to, just to learn him period you know but at the same time as we read the scriptures we're going we're going to come across some things that are going to make us scratch our head a little bit because they are incomprehensible there are certain things is you know here we are we're talking about the eternality of the sun we're you know, you, you talk about the Trinity, and in the first episode of this, you guys were trying to give these, de how do you define the Trinity, and, and how do you articulate that to somebody? Uh, and these are not easy things, uh, and we have to accept them by faith, but we try our best to search the Scripture and pray and ask God, give me a little bit of comprehension on this thing, you know? I mean, and, and but we but we accept it by faith either way. And that's the thing. We have to believe the Bible, and God, I think God honors that because we have faith in what he says. But he wants to share us as we grow. He wants to share with us through the comprehension of what is in his word, you know, as we grow, as we, as we commit to know more. And so I hate to use the word balance, but I think there is a balance, a good balance between having faith because you don't understand it, and studying so that they do understand it, and getting that from the Holy Spirit, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Teacher, teacher if I, I keep interjecting, I'm sorry, Luke. You know that's a problem of mine. But, uh, teacher, if you get a chance, uh, I, ha I this thing started because I, I had a, a thought regarding the Trinity, and if you get a chance on my channel to go watch uh, Oneness versus the Trinity, uh, I would sure appreciate it. I, I think it's a unique understanding uh, that, that I may have stumbled on. Yeah, I, I heard you share that. I, I'll be honest, I haven't looked at it yet, but I heard you share that in the beginning on the first one. And uh, I, I listened to that whole... I mean, I haven't watched the video itself, but I did uh, listen to all the descriptions and everything from the first video, or from the first uh, conversation. Oh, okay. Thanks, teacher. All right, very good. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm justified in calling Jack, calling him Saint Jack, uh, is not because he's gone out and performed miracles and he's been some kind of superstar Christian that deserves some kind of special status. That's what uh, Roman Catholicism uses to classify someone as a saint. They're like a, a superstar Christian. But um, the, the word saint in the scriptures is just uh, interchangeable with believer. or, or uh, And so all of us who believe in Jesus for our salvation, uh, then we, we, can, uh, we are justified in being called saints according to the scriptures. 
So let's go to Brother Sam. Hello, Brother Luke. What can I do for you? <sighs> can you hear me okay? You need to get some you need to get some grass planted out there, Sam. Oh, it's just Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was I made a long talk just for like talk to like water. No one heard me so cuz I had my mic turned off. Sorry. Oh, no. You, yeah. you did it again, brother. Yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah, brother, brother Sam, uh, I'm going to read another statement. I mean, I'll let be, you be the first to reply to it. So just meet for just a second and then I'll I'll have you go first, okay? Okay, great. Okay, it says um um, Jehovah God declared himself to be eternal. That's Exodus 3.14. says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This verse speaks of God's eternality. It is not I was, but I am. God is a present tense God. The sense is of this title for God is not only I am what I am at present, but I am what I have been, and I am what I shall be, and shall be what I am. Okay, so Brother Sam, you get first chance at that. Well, you know, uh basically states the essence of, of God uh, being what he is. Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier, I, I believe. Uh, I'm sure uh, Brother Bill mentioned that uh, earlier as well. Uh, state of being, I think that's, I think that's, uh, I think that's a better term to use than to express anything than I am, you know, like when also, even like when 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 you call people some names, you know, like give a name, for example, like if someone call me Sam, you know, I'm that particular person, you know, but as much as that, also, uh, I think when when God said I am. He didn't actually want to like give himself a name almost, I think. I don't know if, you know, I could be wrong, but uh, it seems like as if like he didn't want to set himself in that limit, limitation. Um, so, I don't know what, I don't know if you know what I mean. Well, it gets back to the point that some of this is just uh, in incomprehensible, inexplicable. It's just really hard to explain. We're doing, we're, we're grasping for words, but what I'm asking here is, or what this uh, this uh, writer is supposing is, uh, God's in the present tense. So, so does that mean that uh, past, present, and future is all the same? Is all present tense for God, and that's why He is called I Am. Uh, and then I've also just something came to my mind. I asked Brother Bill to first react to it. What I just said there, and throw in what it says in Revelation, where it says Jesus, um, and it was referring to Jesus, who was and is and is to come. So in that case, it's not referring to it as a present tense. Brother Bill. Well, I think I think this is a good verse. In it, it actually says you know, that, that Christ is expressing the is the beginning and the end. So he's expressing his eternality in the first portion of that verse, but then he's explaining it in human terms that perhaps we can grasp <laughs> that is which is and which was and which is to come. So perhaps God in his mercy is expressing his eternality in the first portion of that verse. This is Revelation one eight, and then in in human terms that that you know that the which is you know, which was and which is to come. You know, so that I don't you know, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. You know, God is eternal, Alpha and Omega, yet he stepped into time and he is the the was, is and is to come still. So he, 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 he 
is across broad. You know, it isn't limited again, as we were saying earlier. It's not limited to our time space. It's not limited to his time space, if it is time and space, even at that. You know, he is God, and he can, as Brother Joe said, you know, earlier on, and has said in a few hangups, he can step literally into our time and space and out again, as he so chooses and when he needs to. Okay, uh, I think I'll, I think St. Tommy was gesturing to talk, so uh, Joe, I'll come right back to you, St. Tommy. Thank you, brother. Um, thank God he is faithful. He was faithful. He is faithful, and he will be faithful. And yes, may the redeemed of the Lord say so with great joy and confidence in his faithfulness, not in our performance or in our strength of our flesh not in in this not with confidence in our commitment but confidence in his faithfulness um, one reason I enjoy the privilege of declaring myself and labeling myself as saint and and encouraging others to call me saint is is because it reminds me it reminds me of who I am in him and that he is faithful and I will always be him his based on one act of righteousness his act of righteousness I tend to doubt sometimes uh, to discerning eyes here on this panel um, it's not hard to figure out weakness as you behold me I'm sure and um, uh, but it is a good thing that I am reminded the, of who I am in Christ Jesus even as I struggle with weakness uh, it is a good thing that I behold him and what he has done for us and 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 constantly be reminded every day of his faithfulness of what he has done on the cross uh, and 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 the power of, of his blood and and that I am in him and he is in me um, to, call, to declare myself as, as Saint Tommy is a bit b boasting, a bit boasting, but I submit to all that it is a boast based on his faithfulness, not on my maturity, nor on my commitment level, nor on my performance, but a, a boast based on his faithfulness and his blood. Um, mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's... Uh... We can't resist always coming back to the gospel. I mean, it's just because we 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 love our Savior and we love this gospel, and uh, no matter what we're talking about, that always enters into the conversation. So, sola gloria, all the glory to Jesus. Amen, brother. Brother. Amen. Amen. Well, well, that's exactly why I love having Tommy. In a hangout, when I'm in a hangout, he always brings us back to some of those basics that are, are uh, even more incomprehensible than the detail work we're looking at now. But in regards to the verse, <clears throat> the first thing that came to my mind as you read that, Luke, was, uh, you know, number one, we always and, and lazily fall back to, well, it's incomprehensible, and, and of course it is, but what can we get from this verse? Well, we can get what it doesn't say. He says that I am that I am. Uh, it doesn't say I am because, I am if, I am often, I am and was, I will be, I can be. It's, it's a I am that I am. And so we can learn a lot by what's not there or what could have been there and the eternality uh, of the statement. And I also really like how you brought revelations into it the verse where uh, that you spoke of in revelation shows us that he is also chose to put himself with us on our path in the timeline that he's created yeah okay thank you brother very well said and uh, brother Jack I am that I am that uh, concept, please. Yeah, I think uh, I think Joe uh, hit it pretty good uh, on both cases of the I am. Uh, 
of Exodus and the uh, Alpha and Omega of Revelation. Uh, just to throw in there that I think in our belief and in our understanding of that, uh, in regards to this eternal God, we must, we must remember uh, that even though the things around us change, uh, whether it be society, our view on things, whatever the case may be, his view on things never change. And what he says and his holiness never changes. Okay? And uh, we, we kind of get a tendency sometimes, and when I say we, I'm just talking about um, people as a whole sometimes. As we get especially into these latter days, uh, we must remember the gospel hasn't changed. We, we must remember that the way he looks on holiness hasn't changed. He is what he is. He's a self-sufficient one. And uh, we really have to remember who he is. And I believe that's the point about what he's saying of who the purpose of this I am that I am. Uh, he, is, he is the holy one. He is the self-existent one. And uh, we may change, but he does not. Okay. Uh, Brother Jack, um, I, you don't have my notes in front of you, I don't think, but uh, you... Uh, you jump right ahead where I was going to go next with this. So let me. I'm going to read a couple point. Make a couple of points quickly. No, I don't. I don't have your notes. No. Just. To, just so you know. Well, I think that uh, this proves that great minds uh, stink alike. I mean, think alike. Okay. Here goes. I'm going to read a couple of points, and then I'm going to ask everybody to give a response to this, and then we'll be finishing up pretty soon here. The point is this: that that verse, this writer says. That the verse uh, I am, uh, that I am, he says, this verse speaks of God's eternality, God's immutability, God's self existence. Uh, so let me read what he says about that. He says, it is not I was, but I am. It is a present tense God. Uh, the sense of this title for God is not only I am what I am at present, but I am what I have been, and I am what I shall be, and shall be what I am. This verse also speaks of God's immutability. Every time you find or perceive God, he is always the same. Finite man is subject to change, but an infinite God is not because of the constancy of his name. This verse speaks of God's self-existence, not I want to be, or I should be, or I need to be, or I will be, but I am. From before recorded time, Jesus and his Father were one in essence, sharing equally in the attribute of eternality. And we'll go to Brother uh, Bill first on this. Well, that was pretty deep. <laughs> I'd have to agree with what he's just said, but that is pretty deep, and I don't know how far you want me to dig with that one. Uh, well, you, you know, whatever you either want to say or don't want to say, it's fine. We got plenty of people to express their opinions. If you want to hold back here, fine. Well, no, I would like to say that I agree with what you said, but uh, yeah, I have to agree with what you said. So this, in other words, uh, he's claiming here that the verse "I am," that I am. It is showing that God's eternality, his immutability, and his self-existence. So uh, let me ask Brother uh, Brother Joe to c comment on those three points. Are, are, those, can, are those established by this statement, I am that I am? I, yeah, yeah it, it, it is. And it's, a, it's another one of those mind pretzel things. You know, there's a, there's a simplicity in the verse, isn't there? Uh, but there's also a depth that, that obviously we just can't comprehend. Uh, I would interject that uh, that there is certainly I'm, try, I'm trying to put it into words. Luke, give me just give me just a second. Uh, what I'm trying to to express is that while God is perfect and unchanging, He's not unmovable, and and sometimes. Uh, especially in the atheist communities and, and the non-believer communities, that, well, if God uh, is is uh, unchangeable, 
how can he do how why this and why that I think it's important to note that God is perfect and but is also has a personality that changes to circumstance in our will he has foreknowledge of everything he has and will do but he also can be pliable and amendable and he can do things differently based upon the reactions of his creation of course which he has foreknowledge of but uh, I, I guess I can't express myself here I, I'm kinda losing my my uh, focus but there is something deep here that I wish I could express better mm. I think yeah. you're just proving you're proving the point about the inexplicability uh, it, it just we're, we we as Arctic, and I've said this about you before, brother. I, I don't mind flattering you again, but you're definitely one of the most articulate people I know on YouTube, um, uh, and you're uh, and you're, you're struggling, and I and we all are struggling because some things are incomprehensible, inexplicable, and we're just doing the best we can as is, uh, uh, you know, or with our limited abilities. Brother, were you saying something, brother Bill? Yeah, I was only just gonna. Agree and, and adds a little bit more to to what Brother Joe was saying. Yeah, God is in certain portions of His character and His promises, He is immutable and unchangeable and cannot move and will not move, which is a blessing, really, because if He promised salvation to those who simply believe, we have that and He will not change His mind. On it. But we also aware that that God repented. 30 times plus, I change his mind, so he's pliable in as much as he can be within the <laughs> within the restraints of his immutability. This has grown really deep, and <laughs> it's quite amazing, you know, that, that, that Brother Dresden, his mind thinks like mine. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's, uh, Bill, Bill it's, I just remembered something. It says God is just in all things and in all ways. But he's not. In, he's he's unjust in his mercies. He sets aside. Well, Christ died, so the sacrifice is paid. But he's he's he shows. Uh, in showing mercy, he tempers justice. So it, he is quite a a con something. I, I my mind is losing it again. I'm sorry. I'm without words again. But there's something there, guys. There's something there. Um, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm thinking what you're saying, and I can't put it in words either. But I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, yeah. like, um, I don't know if I, um, when I think about that, I mean, we talked about that earlier. It seems like uh, it's a little redundant, you know, about this I am. But I think bottom line is one of the reasons uh, that we are having a little difficult time understanding it's because it's so true you know it's like the ultimate truth I mean how can you be more truer than I am you know so okay uh, brother Jack uh, the, it's the point that uh, this verse uh, speaks of his uh, eternality his immutability this unchangeability and his self-existence. Uh, your comment on that, and then we're going to end up in the broadcast here pretty soon. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what Joe was saying, and Bill, I think it, it's very true. But when, but when I when I think of his, shall we use the term amending uh, something? It is because of his mercy, and that is what's not changing. He takes an entire psalm. Uh, and says in every single verse uh, that his mercies uh, endure forever. God, that's that's an attribute that he has. That when he says I am, and his immutability is that he's always merciful. And no, we, you know, obviously mercy is not getting what you deserve. And so, yeah, we don't get that. But that's part of that immutability. Is he wants to show us mercy? Okay. And although he's holy, and boy, we deserve a, you know, we deserve to be taken to the woodshed so bad, but he loves us so much that as long as he sees in us the heart 
that seeks after him through the Holy Spirit, that yielding to the Holy Spirit, he holds back that wrath. So that's part of who he is. And he's not this mean God that everybody, or I can't, or a lot of atheists or unbelievers accuse him of being of. You know, a, a study shows that, yes, we have this God that is immutable. He is that great I am God. But you have to learn, as we said earlier but through the study, to learn who he is, to learn this great love that, you know, Bill covered earlier in, when he got into presenting the gospel um, while he was defining something. You know, wh what is the desire of God? Is that we come to him as Savior, you know, him being the Savior, that w we come to him to be saved. And he presents himself as his holy God, but yeah, hey, I'm the Savior, and I'm trying to be merciful to you. And... Uh, and that doesn't change. It just doesn't change. We we it should change the way we behave. It should change even sometimes after we get saved. He should be spanking us because now we know better. But guess what? His mercy just endureth forever. I'm I'm glad he doesn't change or I'd be in trouble. Amen. Well, I'm gonna say an amen to that. Amen. Amen. The uh, it strikes me the the difference. You used mercy a lot there. And uh, all of us are always proclaiming the grace of God. And I, I, I think that uh, a lot of people think that mercy and grace are synonymous and they're, they're uh, interchangeable words. But I, I think they're really uh, kind of opposing ideas. Uh, mercy means that God is sparing you from something bad that you deserve. Uh, grace is God is granting you graciously something wonderful that you don't deserve so in that way they're kind of opposite ideas and I am so thankful for God's mercy and his grace and that leads us to the uh, final topic of the show here we want to take a few minutes in the end here to tell everybody how to receive this mercy and grace from our great Savior God Jesus and uh, let me ask Brother Bill if there's anybody watching now that has he has not become a saint like St. Tommy and St. Bill and St. Joe, Joe and St. Jack and St. Sam and St. Luke. We're all saints. Uh, we're justified in taking that title because saint means we're someone who believes in Jesus for our salvation. And so, therefore, the Bible says we are saints. If someone wants to uh, become a saint and go to, be able to go to heaven, be assured, uh, be confident that they're going to go to heaven when they... Uh, what, what do they have to do, brother? Well, let's tell them. Well, first of all, we need to quickly clear up and say that to be a saint, you do not have to grasp all the things that are unfathomable, because God is unfathomable. We can comprehend some things, you know, we can understand some facts, and, and even as mature Christians, we can get so far, but we, we would never know entirely God and to, you know, we, we, we put off this corruptible and put on the incorruptible. So you have to go at the brass tacks. If you, if you want to become a saint, like as Brother Lucas just said, you need simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's recorded in the Bible, you know, with Philippine jailer. Paul and Silas were there. You know, these were godly men. And, and the Philippine jailer, because of the consequences and things that happened, was just about to kill himself. But he cried aloud just before he did, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, not what have I got to understand? You know, what theological degree do I need? Do I need to fathom all the mysteries of God? No, he went straight to the brass tax of this and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That is how much you need to fathom and understand of God today at least. That, that Christ is Saviour, and he desires that every single creature is saved. But you also, we need to call upon this Christ. You know, he's not going to come in, and, as some would teach, and, and take away all our free will, and drag us, you know, kicking and screaming at the kingdom of heaven. You know, he's desirous that we choose out of our love, and out of our own volition, to, to, to call upon him. And I would say that to be saved is to simply, initially, to call upon this Christ, knowing that you are in need and desperate need even of a saviour. 
You know, this is this is the simplest way we can explain salvation. You know, but you know that, that this Christ who we've been preaching on and teaching on the unfathomable one, you know, he does love you dearly today, and, and he made payment for all your wrongs. You know, all the things that you've done wrong. You know, your past, even now, and what you're going to do in the future. This same Jesus who is unfathomable made payment for that because he loves you, and he died for that cause. He was buried for that cause, but thanks be to God, he rose for that same very cause, being the first of the risen, the first fruit of many. If you was to believe on just those simple facts without grasping or comprehending, you know, God, because it is unfathomable entirely. If you was to just grasp those simple facts and put your trust in them and in whom they're wrought, which is Jesus Christ, you will become a saint this day. You know, what we're speaking of today in Brother Luke's Hangout is, is the real meat of the word. We are trying to comprehend the uncomprehendable, all right? But, you know, we, we're supposed to study to assure ourselves approved, and we're going to do that, and we will try and explain things, you know, to, to more mature Christians. But if you want, like the brass tacks, just believe on Christ today, and you will be saved, and you will be a saint forevermore. Amen. Amen. I was thinking that just before you said that about the difference between the milk and the meat, you know, as a, uh, if someone out there has not put their faith in Jesus and, you know, become what, what Scripture says is a saint, to someone who's saved, who's assured salvation and eternal life in the kingdom of God, uh, if you're watching and you've never put your faith in Jesus and received this salvation, then what you need, of course, is first is the milk, and you're not you're not ready for the kind of meat. Probably you'll have a hard time really understanding and following all the things we're talking about because uh, most of us we've spent you know much of our whole lifetime studying the scriptures and and trying to figure out these difficult things. But salvation is not difficult. It's simple. It's easy. Jesus said, "My yoke is easy. My burden is light." So don't think you have to burden and struggle and try to strive your way to heaven. That's not how you do it. You, you, know, you just trust Jesus. He did all the work. He took on the burden for you. He died for our sins. And it's easy. His yoke is easy. To get yoked to Jesus, to join Jesus, to become one with him, to be in Christ, all you got to do is put your faith on him instead of your religion or your own works or anything else. Just put your faith in him. I'm going to ask give uh, Brother Jack, since he's... Uh, new to the uh, show, I'll give him last words, see if he has any final words before we close. Well, I'll tell you what, this has been, this has been good, and, uh, you know, we, we trust in a, uh, any eternal God, and as I said on uh, Resurrection Sunday, a few, or I guess last week, the difference between Christendom and the rest of the religions of the world is that we serve a living God. Uh, he is alive, and he's a God of now. And I guess that's what that last statement, the I am that I am. And he's there for us. He is wanting to be known uh, by us. He wants... And, uh, you know, if we just go to him, as, as Brother Bill said, you know, you just acknowledge that he is... Uh, and then you just by faith come to him uh, where you can have this eternal God be at your side uh, by aid of the Holy Spirit he can be at your side uh, I, I can't I can't explain enough in this short amount of time just the fact of how wonderful God is and uh, the difference it will make in anybody's life to have the friend of Jesus to have the Savior of Jesus uh, there with us uh, and guide us through each and every day and uh, that's pretty much I, I don't want to drag in anything Luke I appreciate the being able to say a few words here at the end all right uh, thank you brother Jack uh, oh by the way brother uh, Jack didn't have an opportunity when he joined us to talk about his channel so I'll just tell you his channel is titled uh, teacher of the Bible so I hope you subscribe to his channel along with uh, the Panda Man Evangelist, uh, Sebastian Dresden, Thick Shades, Uncle Sam. Subscribe to all their channels. I, I know you'll be blessed to uh, uh, look at their videos and 
follow their comments. So uh, thank you for watching and if today is the day for you to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation then if you if you do that then uh, please make a comment on this video so we, we, we know that today is the day you receive this free gift of eternal life. Uh, I'm going to close the live broadcast. Uh, panelists will keep talking privately for fellowship uh, if you're able to stay. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.